Well, DAP is, affects clinical outcomes in two ways. One, it reduces ischemic events, uh, ischemic events related to the stent and the stented segment itself, but also to patients with multicentric, multivessel disease, multisystem disease, which typically atherosclerosis is. It doesn't just only happen at a little focal spot in the coronary arteries. So there's secondary prevention, and there's also prevention of stent-related events, particularly stent thrombosis. Second, the downside of DAP is bleeding. And everybody knows that, and that's a significant. It's not always subtle bleeding. It can be fatal bleeding. So there's a balance between reduction in ischemic events, increase in bleeding events. And that's the fine balance that we try to achieve. I think there's such a debate because it's been a totally moving target. You know, the evolution in stent technology has been tremendous. From the first generation uh, bare metal stents and first generation DES to the newer generation DES. And so the propensity for stent thrombosis has changed dramatically over a period of time. And so what we would have prescribed for dual antiplatelet therapy five to seven years ago, 10 years ago, would be very different than what we think is optimal at this time. Because the hazard related to the stent itself has dropped exponentially. It's a function of stent strut thickness. Thinner is better, thinner struts, less um, abnormalities in coronary flow velocity and shear stress that occur with thicker struts. These are thrombogenic. They promote thrombus formation. Uh, there are polymers that have changed, uh, that have become uh, less thrombogenic, maybe even thromboresistant in some cases, meaning prevent thrombus, which is good. And I think stents uh, have become um, a better mousetrap, so to speak, a better device with less complications associated with them. The other thing that we know that we don't do enough of, frankly, particularly in the United States, is optimally deploy stents. For example, imaging at the time of stent deployment has been shown to significantly reduce complications related to the stent, including thrombosis. And unfortunately, imaging with either IVUS or OCT, optical coherence tomography, is done in the minority of cases in the US. So we can improve our outcomes and reduce the need for DAP in fact, there is um, a study that particularly showed that with long stents called IVUS XPL uh, for long stents, and IVUS itself significantly reduced thrombosis in those stents compared to no IVUS, okay? Patients were randomized to imaging or no imaging. So I think these are uh, things that we've learned, and I think the moving target has been to reduce the duration of DAPT. And now we're really refining it to determine do we need DAPT or do we need MAPT, mono antiplatelet therapy. Uh, there are multiple studies in the last year that have seriously questioned the duration of aspirin or even the role of aspirin as a component of DAPT. And maybe monotherapy with P2Y12 inhibitor alone, whether it's clopidogrel, you know, ticagrel or uh, prasugrel, maybe that's the way to go. Um, when do you drop the aspirin? And I'll tell you, the data really look pretty consistent and look pretty favorable that, again, aspirin may be more of a problem than it is an asset, at least in the long term. DAP does. There's no stent that is free of stent thrombosis that I know of. Uh, there are some that have very low rates. And I think the stent engineering, stent uh, strut thickness, getting thinner struts, strut geometry, rounded struts may be beneficial, maybe facilitate embedment, reduce uh, shear stress distribution, uh, abnormalities, which are thrombogenic, and uh, flexibility, conformability of the devices.
that also. You know, when you put in a stiff stent, it geometrically distorts the vessel. It creates abnormalities in coronary flow velocity and shear stress at the stent margins that can be thrombogenic as well and promote restenosis in, in addition to thrombos. So I think we're making better devices and uh, the need for prolonged DAP has dropped like a rock. And I think you should see changes in the U.S. guidelines uh, that will parallel those we've already seen in the European guidelines. Stent related, but also patient related. And uh, there are patients, for example, that um, I use DAP risk scores, okay, like uh, precise DAP and then the DAP score as well. Those are the two that I use in sequence. Uh, and I think that for the average case with a second, third generation thin strut DES, that if they're stable, three months is probably enough. Unstable, probably six months, not kidding. And then beyond that, um, if the patient is a low risk for bleeding, you know, has a DAP risk score of, let's say, uh, greater than or equal to two, those patients have ischemic benefit, but without bleeding risk, so to speak, with prolonged DAP. And those are the kind of patients that I might go with a P2Y12 monotherapy, for example, long term. Why? Because, you know, in our study, the DAP trial, which I was co-PI with Laura Mori, we compared 12 to 30 months. 30 months reduced the risk of MI and stent thrombosis compared to 12 months. 55% of the MIs that were reduced had nothing to do with the stented segment. Those are, we're helping those patients. It's a secondary prevention treatment. Most recently, global leaders, they basically cut aspirin at a month and went with two years of ticagrelor, Belenta therapy. They had in beyond one year where patients were either on Belenta monotherapy or aspirin monotherapy beyond the first year in global leaders. They had significant reductions in stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction, exactly what we saw in the DAP trial. And I'll guarantee you that if they, I didn't see the breakdown, that the majority of those MIs have nothing to do with the stented segment. So they're finding the same thing, that in patients who have markers for ischemic risk, like symptomatic peripheral vascular disease, history of MI, history of stroke in the past, you know, things that I think are markers for having bad outcomes and being at ischemic event risk. That if the patients can tolerate it, they're at low risk of bleeding, then you should use antiplatelet therapy, possibly with P2Y12 monotherapy uh, in an extended fashion because it reduces their risk of subsequent events. Yeah, uh, stent design really matters. Uh, flexibility, conformability, strut thickness is a big player here. Thinner struts is better, less thrombogenic. The polymer can influence the thrombogenicity, okay, meaning it can be thromboresistant and prevent thrombus, you know, reduce platelet adhesion, activation, and aggregation. And so I think the stent design uh, clearly impacts. And the newer stent designs are getting less and less thrombogenic. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a good time. Uh, the uh, issue of giving DES a year and BMS 30 days has been totally debunked. You know, in Europe, there's a class one level evidence A for DES over bare metal stent for any PCI, meaning there is no role for bare metal stent in Europe. U.S. guidelines are still trying to figure this out. I've been saying it for at least five years, in all honesty, and they can say whatever they want, but mm -hmm. bottom line is bare metal stent are more thrombogenic than the second and third generation DES for multiple reasons. In general, thicker struts. Also, the medicine that's eluded has anti-inflammatory uh, properties which reduce the reaction to stent vessel injury, which can be thrombogenic as well.
Well, you know what the big problem is here? It's like a roulette wheel. There's so many different options. So that's one of the confusing aspects. Clopidogrel, ticagrelor. You know, we have a bunch of good drugs. It's going to be very hard to do studies large enough, long enough to compare all these different drugs. I think the tenets that I try to simplify with are, do you need aspirin, yes or no? You know, what agent, single agent, do you want to go with long term? I don't think you need two agents long term. That's my honest opinion. I probably would give DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy, for as little as one to three months, period, and go with a single agent after that with the newer drug, with the newer devices. Um, I like monotherapy. I like monotherapy with P2Y12 inhibitors. I really do. Uh, both uh, Onyx-1 and Synergy, I think, should get one and three month indications based on large scale clinical trials. So that's DAP for one month, DAP for three months. And then they went with either monotherapy with aspirin or P2Y12 afterwards. I think when you look at the global leaders, ACS subgroup, when you look at Twilight, I really think that you could go with aspirin for an abbreviated course in combination with a drug like ticagrelor and just cut the aspirin. I really do believe that most of the bleeding problems in long term have been related to gastrointestinal bleeding and related to aspirin.